this morning to the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm glad that we could be here today. We're thankful for your presence, your visiting with us. Uh, we're again glad and thankful that you've come. Trust you would feel welcome here among us. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to bring a very simple thought this morning, a very simple message. Uh, won't deal with anything very deep. Uh, not going to go into deep waters. I heard one man make a statement uh, concerning uh, his, or I heard this told about a man made a statement concerning his preacher, said he goes the deepest and, come up and comes up with the leastest. So I'm not going to try to go deep with you this morning. Uh, I'm going to just uh, bring forth, try to bring forth what is on my heart. First Corinthians chapter 1, if you would follow along with me and I'm going to begin to read in verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. I'm going to stop reading there in verse 25. If you would just keep your Bible open. I want to go back and at least look at a few statements that Paul made here. I guess of all the sermons throughout the year that a pastor preaches, that usually the one after revival is about the most difficult want to just get settled on what to preach, that uh, ordinarily a lot of things are going through your mind, and a lot of different thoughts, maybe things that even uh, through the preaching of the past week that you've meditated on those things and thought about those things, and it's good to hear a man preach besides you, and I'm going to say that for myself, I know you would probably amen that, it's good for you to hear somebody else from time to time, it's certainly good for me. Because I know how I think, I know how my mind works. And uh, even though it's the same gospel, it's the same message, to hear it brought out in a little bit different way is something that's a blessing uh, to my heart. But when you think about that Sunday after revival, uh, I'm not going to, it wasn't my intention this morning just to preach it, maybe a follow up message from revival, but. If the Lord continues to lead me in the way that I'm settled right now, that's what I'm going to try to do today, is uh, just try to uh, move forward in even the things that uh, he said and, and, and try to uh, just at least bring a question to your mind. And uh, as I thought about the revival week this past week, uh, there's some things that I want to remind you of. I know that some of you know Brother Webb very well. Some of you have been knowing him a lot longer than I've been knowing him. But I said this, I believe on Monday night, that I had the opportunity to really get to know him uh, during the time that I pastored down at McHenry because that he had pastored that church for a long, a long number of years. I think it was seven or eight years, maybe nine years, that he was there as pastor. And, I didn't follow up directly after him. There were a couple between us. But when I came there, that his name was called a whole lot. And uh, they had great respect for him. And uh, he was a great blessing to the church. He came very close to those people. But through his time there as a pastor, that there was a lot of times that he'd get called back. Just about every funeral that we had, he'd have a part in it. He preached a revival or two there. There were times that he would visit and uh, I got to know him very, I think, very, very well. We had the opportunity to go to Canada together. 
uh, of course, some of us went a, maybe a couple of years ago now. And prior to that, several years, we'd taken a trip, and he had been with us on that trip. And uh, through the youth fellowships and through different things that I've, I, I feel like I'm, I'm knowing pretty well. I feel like I'm pretty close to him. And I believe that I can say with confidence of several things that I'll remind you of this morning. Uh, first of all, that I believe that Brother Webb's a man of God. I'm not, listen, I'm not preaching on him this morning. I'm getting to a, a thought. So don't, don't say, well, where, where are you going with this? I believe he's a man of God. I believe with all my heart that, that uh, the Lord had not only saved his soul, he told us about that the other night, didn't he? Uh, very detailed about the time that he uh, finally just quit trusting in what he was doing and just turned things over to the Lord and was saved. But I not only believe that he saved but I believe that the Lord called him to preach. And I believe there's been evidence of that in his ministry. He's been faithful to the ministry. He preaches the truth. Uh, you've seen results from his ministry. And so that I've got confidence uh, in that, that he's a, a man of God. I believe he's got God's people at heart, God's work at heart. I had the opportunity to sit with him in a Sunday school writers meeting a couple of weeks ago. And uh, to see the even that monumental task that he's taken on of, if you look in your adult Sunday school book, I believe he writes maybe one whole quarterly, or at least close to a whole quarterly, every other time it comes around. And I will tell you from experience, you don't sit down in a couple of hours and write a Sunday school quarterly. Uh, we were talking about that the other day, me and him. I write some of the junior lessons, and he's writing the adults, so that's a whole different ball game. But uh, he asked me, he said, how long does it take you to write one of those junior lessons? And I sat down and, and tried to figure it up. I said, well, start to finish, usually at least eight hours. And uh, a lot of times that you don't have eight hours straight to devote to that. So it takes you several days. Uh, by the time you may spend two or three hours on it one day, two or three hours the next. And I can just imagine, he said, well, uh, you know, at least that on mine. I can imagine the time that, that he puts into those things. I don't believe he's in a popularity contest. I don't believe that Brother Webb's trying to be one that gets all the revivals. I don't believe that that has any influence or bearing upon what he preaches. Uh, I believe that it's, it's his desire, his desire to preach the Word of God, to preach what the Lord puts on his heart. And I believe I can say this, I, I say it with all confidence, and I don't believe that he'd be embarrassed or have to turn his head or turn red if he was standing here this morning. I don't believe that Brother Webb's got a file that he goes to in his file cabinet at home and he pulls, out where these, he pulls out his revival file. And he's got five messages that he preaches in each revival. I don't believe that's the case. Uh, I, I, I believe there's some preachers that do that. I'll just be honest with you. I don't know necessarily. I, I can't call names and I, I couldn't pin it on any, any, in, any individuals. I think there's probably some out there somewhere that probably do that. They've got some good messages they like to preach, and there's some messages that you just like to preach more than others. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest, just to use for an example, I preached last Wednesday night, I believe, or Wednesday night before, about the fear of God. I love preaching on the fear of God. It's just something I enjoy preaching about. What I'm saying is this, that I believe that he sought the Lord's will in what he preached this week. I believe that he got himself out of the way. And I believe that he just said, Lord, that let me be your vessel. I want you to use me. And uh, whatever it is that, that you would have to be brought forth, then you lay that on my heart and help me to be humble enough to just go and, and preach it. And I believe that when he came and he stood there, or stood here this week behind this podium, uh, that he preached what he preached for one reason. And that is that he was completely settled that this is God's will. I'm preaching this not because I think cert certain people will be here or because what I know about Lone Star Church, I think this is what they need to hear. I don't believe that was the case at all, but I believe that he preached that because that he was certain and settled that that's what the Lord wanted to preach. And you say, well, how can a man be settled on those things? It's hard to understand it if you're not a preacher. I know Brother Monroe could attest to what I'm about to say, and if there were others here that were preachers, they could as well, that the Lord just is able to settle you. He's able to give you a peace. He's able to put thoughts in your heart. He's able to let you know that what you're preaching is 
is His Word. Now, let's think about that from the other side of the coin. Let's think about that from the side of the Lord, from God's perspective. As Brother Webb, I believe, preached that, that he felt confident was the Lord's will, from the standpoint of the Lord, who Brother Webb got the messages from, God knew who was going to be here, didn't he? My God knows all things. He knows eternity future. He knows eternity past. He knows the present. There's nothing hidden from his sight. The Bible's very plain concerning that. I don't believe I have to try to prove that to you this morning. God knew exactly who would be here. And I believe the messages that were sent this week were sent for those of you that would be here. I, I believe this. I believe there's another side to that. I, I believe the Lord can send a message for somebody that's not here. And I know there's people that would maybe argue with me on that, but I, I think it's the case. I believe sometimes that a man preaches a message for somebody that's not there. And I believe the Lord had put it on that person's heart to come. And I believe one day that person will have to answer to the Lord for why they didn't come. The Lord said, well, you know, I sent you the message. And you chose to do something else. You chose not to come. But I believe most of the time that the message the Lord sends is to someone who is there. A lot of you were here all week this week. Some of you are here some of the week. So the Lord knew you were going to be here. And furthermore, the Lord knows what you need more than you even know yourself, doesn't he? But he knew you would come and he knew that, that maybe a burden on your heart, maybe that you hadn't even thought about, that he knows that you needed it. So having said all of those things, I want us to go back to verse 17. And in this passage that I read, Paul here speaks about the purpose of preaching. And that's why I said all that that I said, not to pin roses upon Brother Webb. He's just a man. Uh, he's a sinner. He's got faults. Uh, but I believe that he did come and preach what the Lord put on his heart. But in verse 17, I want you to notice the statement that's made here. Paul said, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So when you think about the purpose of preaching, Paul said, he, he said, that's why I came. He said, I didn't come to add people to the church. I didn't come so that members could be placed on the roll. I didn't come to baptize. But he said, I came to preach the gospel. And he said how he did that, he said, I didn't do it with wisdom of words. I didn't try to make it flowery. I didn't try to, you know, make it to where it would be very uh, convincing or something that would be uh, very appealing. He said, I, it was none of those things. He said, if I did that, he said, it would take away from the effect of just the plain preaching of the cross of Jesus Christ. So he said, I came and I, I preached the gospel. Now go down to... Verse 18, the very next verse. He said, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. A lot of times at the end of a revival week, at least in my mind, a lot of the messages will sort of run together if I just try to go back and think about all of them. And so I may not have the night right. I believe I do. I believe Friday night, Brother Stephen read some verses out of the book of Matthew about the trial of Jesus Christ and uh, how that uh, of the witnesses that uh, are in the scriptures that testify to the fact that Jesus is the Christ and he mentioned the cross of Jesus Christ but Paul here said that the preaching of the cross is to them that perish th those that are perishing those that are without Christ he said to them it's foolishness now what does the word foolishness mean it means it's silly it's absurd. It's worthless. And there are a lot of people today that consider the preaching of the gospel silly. Oh, that's just a waste of time. I don't know why they do that. But he went on in that particular verse of scripture. He said, but unto us which are saved. He said, it is the power of God. To those of us who have trusted Christ as our Savior, the preaching of the cross of Christ is not foolishness. It's not silly. It's not absurd. He said it is empowered by God. 
And I want you to think about it if you're saved here this morning. I want you to go back in your life and think when it was that the Lord Jesus Christ burdened your heart for the first time through the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Let's go back and think about that for a minute. When was the first time that you realized, you know, I've heard this all my life, but man, I'm a sinner. I'm doomed, I'm damned, I'm condemned, I'm headed for hell. When did that first hit you? I believe every one of you here this morning, if you're able to go back in your mind to that place, it was a time when the gospel was preached, was it not? A man stood and he proclaimed the message of Jesus Christ. And when he proclaimed that message, it was empowered by God and God took it to a place that he had never taken it before with you. It would always go here, but it may go out here. But this time it came in here and went to the heart. And all of a sudden it was different. So Paul said the preaching of the cross is to those of us who are saved. He said it is the power of God. Go down to verse 21. He said, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Now notice that phrase. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. That that the world calls silly, that calls absurd, that it's a waste of time. There's no point in it. He said that what God does is it's pleased him that through the preaching of the gospel that people would hear... And then what did it say about them? They'd believe. They'd believe. And when they believed the message of the gospel, he said God saved them. And it pleased him to do that. Go back, if you would, to Romans chapter 10 real quick. Just a few pages back. Let's read just a few verses here. And then I want to get, tell you what my thought is and just give you a few examples. And I trust this morning that uh, it could... Be effective in your heart. Romans chapter 10. You think about the preaching of the gospel. He said in verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Remember what Brother Steve preached the other night? That he came to that place, sitting in his car, as he had begged and pleaded, and begged and pleaded, and begged and pleaded, that he finally came to the place where he just said, I said, Lord, I can't do this. That you're going to have to do it. And he gave it to the Lord. He called upon the name of the Lord, the power of the Lord. He called upon on him and he saved him. He said that whosoever, so that's you this morning. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But verse 14, very familiar. How shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? It's impossible to believe in something that you don't know about. So he said here, he's taking it backwards, as I've said many times, that those who believe are those who've heard. And then he goes on and he said, how shall they hear without a preacher? A preacher, a proclaimer, one who would tell the good news of Jesus Christ. Ordinarily when we think about that preacher, we think about one that's doing what I'm doing this morning. But how shall they hear without a preacher? But then you read on to verse 15. How shall they preach except to be sent? Let me, th let me ask that question in a little bit different light. How shall they know what to preach unless they be sent? I'm not changing the scripture. He said, you know, how can they go and how do they know where to go? How do they know what to say unless somebody sends them? Who is it that sins? It's the Lord. He has ordained it that through the church that the gospel message would be taken to the lost of dying and dying world. So he said, how shall they preach except they be sent? As it's written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. What are we proclaiming? We're proclaiming that you can, you can have a right relationship with God. You can have peace with God. And that peace only comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. So how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Let me ask you a question. 
Who is the preaching intended for? Is it intended for the preacher? It is. You don't know how much I get out of... I'm, I, I think you know me well enough to understand what I'm about to say. I get a lot out of my messages sometimes. I'm not saying that braggingly. I get a lot out of studying for the messages. The Lord's speaking to me as He's speaking to you. But when you think about that minister, as that man as he comes, as I come and preach the gospel, and I'm trying to preach the gospel to you this morning. Many years ago, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I'm not preaching to me this morning so I can be saved. The preacher comes and he preaches for those that are there to hear. And that's why he said, how shall they hear unless there be a preacher? As I said, that a lot of you are here most of the week or all week. If my memory served me correctly, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night, Brother Steve preached mainly to the church, to the saved. But then Thursday and Friday night, he preached mainly to the lost. Now let's narrow down everything I've said this morning. Let's narrow it down, very narrow. Try to deal with something for just a few minutes. And listen very carefully. I'm, this is from my heart. Those of you that sit here this morning, and you're lost. Did it ever cross your mind as he was preaching that maybe this is to me? Did that cross your mind either of those nights? As he was talking about, as he was going through his testimony and how that he struggled with things, did it ever cross your mind that maybe the Lord's allowing him to say this because I need to hear this? As he preached Friday night about the fact that Jesus is the Christ. See, that's what you've got to believe to be saved. Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. As he preached to all those witnesses that proclaimed and testified that Jesus is the Savior. Did it ever cross your mind that maybe this message is for me? This is to me. I'm the one that needs to hear this. It's not the one sitting beside me. It's not my buddy on the other side of the church. It's not my friends. It's not the others that are not saved. But maybe it's me. Maybe this preacher tonight, as he's preaching the cross of Jesus Christ, maybe it's not foolishness. Maybe tonight that God has sent this message for me. For me. You know what the devil will do? He'll try to convince you that this, this is not for me. This is for somebody else. But I want you to be honest. I don't... Don't answer out loud. It wouldn't hurt if you did. You'd be in a good shape if you did. But those of you that are here in loss this morning, I want to ask you, and I want you to be honest in your heart when I ask this question. Were those messages that were preached this week, were they preached to you? Perhaps was the Lord sending that for you because you need to be saved. I can go back to a night, it was a summer night in June of 1989. It was on a Thursday night of revival. As the preacher came, and he preached, and it was different that night. He didn't preach anything different than I'd ever heard before. But that night it went all the way to here. And I knew this is, what I, this is what mom and daddy's told me about all my life. There would come a time that the Lord would burden my heart. Bam. I knew it. And God spoke to me. Not audibly. But he spoke to me through the message, the preaching of the gospel that night. And I knew that night if I walked out of that building, having not done anything about it. And by the way, I brought this out. He said, you think you're rejecting the Lord? I said, just saying no. But in essence... When the Lord convicts you of your sin, when you say, no, I'll just wait a little while, you're rejecting that offer. And so I knew that night if I, if I sat, knowing that it was to me, and I didn't do anything about it, 
I knew when I left that building that night that if something were to happen to me, my blood would be on my hands. It wouldn't be on the Lord's hands. I knew that night, and we, we, lived, we lived about 45 minutes. My daddy pastored the church there. We lived about 45 minutes from home. And I knew if I got in my car, and, and, and we were going back to their car, we were going back home that night, and if we were to get in an accident and I was to not come out of their life, I knew I'd had my opportunity. And that God would be just for me to be cast into hell. Because I knew it was to me. I knew it was to me. Go back to the book of Acts chapter 8 if you would real quick. I just want to run through a few examples. Was a message to you this week? Acts chapter 8. Very, very familiar. This is the account of Philip as he was, had gone down to Samaria and he had preached the gospel and about the whole town got saved. Oh, what a time they were having. But I read in verse 26 that the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south under the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, look at the next two words, a man. You see, there was a man. He was way out in the desert. He had been up to Jerusalem. He was going back to Ethiopia. And uh, a lot of things he didn't understand. The Bible describes this man as a eunuch. So really... Without going into great detail, there were a lot of people that would despise him. A lot of people probably looked down upon him. It wasn't his fault. But uh, he was probably one of the world that didn't seem like he was worth a whole lot. But he said as he was returning, verse, verse 28, and sitting in his chariot, that he was reading. And he was reading from Isaiah, or Isaiah, the prophet. And notice verse 29, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Esaias and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? He said, How can I except some man should guide me? He desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, like a lamb done before his shear, he hoped, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who shall declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth? That's what the eunuch was reading. Verse 34, And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Let's don't look at that from the side of Philip. Let's look at that from the side of that eunuch real quick. I don't believe that eunuch was alone. I believe the queen had probably sent some servants with him. He might as well have been alone. He was out there, away from, out in the wilderness, out in the desert. And he was reading. And he didn't have a clue what he was reading. He was confused. I wonder what he thought when he saw that man running up his chariot. You see, God was concerned about that eunuch, wasn't he? God loved that eunuch. And God knew that that eunuch was seeking something. And so he took a very, I'm going to say a very important man. Philip was important at Samaria because those people needed the Lord. They needed to be taught. He's there preaching. But God takes this man and he sends him there with exactly what that eunuch needs to hear. How do you know that? Because at some point, Philip had studied those scriptures, hadn't he? He was able to answer his question. He had studied from Isaiah chapter 53. He knew exactly what that was talking about, that that was a prophecy of the Messiah, of Christ, and the sufferings that he would go through on the cross, and, and, and how that, uh, that God would be satisfied with that, and, and even as he would be buried, and, and then that he would raise again. You reckon that eunuch thought... God's done this for me. This man sent to me. 
I need to respond. I believe he did. How do you know, preacher? Because just a little while longer, they came to water. The eunuch said, what hinders me to be baptized? Philip said, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart. He didn't say in the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, if you believe with all your heart. That's what he was talking about. He said, you may. He said, I'll baptize you if you've trusted in Jesus Christ. Oh, the wonder of God coming to me. Oh, that night there, that, that Thursday night that he came to me. The message was sent to me for this eunuch that here I was and I was desperate and I was in trouble. And here God sent it to me, sent this man to me. And he left there saved. You go over just a few chapters to the 10th chapter and read about another man by the name of Cornelius. And I'm not going to take time to read a lot of it. But Cornelius was uh, a Gentile, said he was, a, he was an Italian, and uh, that he was a God-fearer, and yet that he's lost. And the angel of God appeared unto him and told him to send some men down to Joppa, the house of one Simon. There's a man there by the name of uh, Simon the Tanner. There's a man there by the name of Peter. Ask him to come. The same time Peter had gone up on the housetop about noon, was hungry. He said he fell into a trance. And he looked, and there was a sheet that came down from heaven, knit at the four corners. All kinds of creeping things and four-footed beasts. Unclean things. This happened three times. And the Lord told him, said, rise, Peter, slay and eat. And Peter said, not so, Lord. Nothing unclean or common has ever touched my lips. The Lord let him know. He said, what I've cleansed, call not thou common. About that time, those men that sent from Cornelius came knocking on the door. They said, we've been sent here by Cornelius to come to get you. And Peter understood then the reason that all these things have happened unto me is because there's a man down there that needs the Lord. The Lord's revealed this to me, and he would go there. He would come to the house of Cornelius. And I want you to notice the, what Cornelius would say in, in chapter 10, verse 33. Cornelius said, Now therefore we're all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. What Cornelius was saying is, I know that God sent you to me. And I'm listening. And you just tell me what the Lord wants me to hear. You go on to the 16th chapter of this same book. You find Paul, as he come to a crossroads in his mission work, didn't know where to go. Tried to go one way, tried to go another way, tried to go this way. And then finally, he saw a vision in the night of man. He said, come over into Macedonia and help us. What did Paul find when he got into Macedonia? He found a woman, and her name was Lydia. And she'd go out on the riverside. Her and a, a, a group of people would meet there on the riverside. She was a God-fearing woman, but evidently hadn't heard of Christ. But the Lord sent Paul to that riverside. And I, I love the statement. Let me flip over there so I don't misquote it. In Acts chapter 16, it says in verse 14, And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, listen to this, whose heart the Lord opened. You see, the Lord prepared her heart to hear. And then it said that she attended to the things that were spoken of Paul. Why did she attend to the things that were spoken of Paul? Because she understood that Paul is not preaching his message, but he's been sent from God to me. He sent to me. I could take a lot of time and use a lot of other examples this morning. But I want to pose the question that I posed to you just a few minutes ago, those of you that are here and lost. Those messages that were sent this week, were they sent to you? Ask yourself, is that to me? You can deny it. You can pretend that it wasn't to you. You can make other people think it wasn't to you. I don't know if it was or not. But 
God knows. God knows. Listen to me, you, those of you that are lost. Not only does God love you, but this church loves you. People here love you. They pray for you. There's a lot of you, no doubt, that get your names called daily by multiple people to the Lord because they want to see you saved. And I believe those things have an effect upon the fact... That I know the Lord comes and He reveals Himself to every man. I believe even those prayers would benefit you in knowing that this is to me. This has been very plainly sent to me. To me. You may be at that age that everything that you've ever needed, mom and dad were able to come through and do it for you. If you couldn't do it, mom and daddy could do it. But there's one thing that mom and daddy can't do. No matter how much they love you. Number one, mom and daddy can't convict you of your sin. And mom and daddy sure can't save you. Much as mom and daddy wants to, they can't do it. For the first time in your life, it may be, it's left up to you. But God helps you. He gives grace, doesn't he? He gives grace to the humble. He helps you see your lost condition, and then He helps you see Christ. He says, all you have to do is just accept that. As Brother Webb preached the other night, just come to the place to realize, here's what God's done for me. And He said that if I would trust His Son, that He would save me. And that's what I'm going to do. That I'm going to just trust the merits of Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ has done. I'm going to trust Him. And I'm going to walk away with it in the hands of the Lord. That's all you have to do. I want to close this verse of Scripture this morning. Book of Matthew chapter 7. It may seem an odd place. Matthew chapter 7. You may sit here this morning. I'm not trying to stir emotions. You may sit here and honestly say that, Preacher, those messages were not for me. I didn't feel the convicting power of God in my heart. It was no different from any other time I've heard preacher preach to the lost. Uh, if that's the case, then you don't need to do anything now. But I want you to understand this. That if he's not dealt with, it won't be long until he will. And understand that he's going to send that message to you. It's going to come to me. Very personal, very intimate. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24. This is the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. And in essence, this is a call to decision. Jesus has spent three chapters teaching. And now he basically says, I'm putting the ball in your court. You make the decision. Verse 24, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man that built his house upon the rock, the rains descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. The rains descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Now, it says two houses are contrasted here. One house was built on a rock, one house was built upon the sand. Those houses are lives. Not literal houses, it's people's lives. But what was the difference? It said in verse 24, one heard, this, heard the word of God and did it. One heard the word of God and was obedient. And then it says in verse 26, the other heard the word of God and didn't do it. If the message was to you, are you going to do what he said? Or are you going to walk away? He said, that's what determines your eternity. Not what you hear, but what you do with what you hear. That night that I got saved, I got saved that night that he burdened my heart. 
I don't know that I was the only one that he was dealing with that night. I don't know that. It could have been he was dealing with others. And it could have been that they walked away. And it may be they're still lost today. You see, it's not the hearers that are blessed, but it's the doers, James said. But what he said about these two houses, these two lives, he said the one that heard it and was obedient, he said storms would come, the winds would blow, but he said they'd have something they're anchored to. And they wouldn't fall. There'd be nothing to be able to move them from off that foundation. But he said those that heard it and walked away, he said when the storms came, he said they failed it. And great was the fall of it. For those who reject Christ, disaster awaits. It may not be today, it may not be tomorrow. It may not be next week. But when you take your final breath and leave this world without Jesus Christ, that's a disaster. Eternally doomed and damned to hell and the lake of fire apart from God, having squandered your opportunity to be saved. This morning, it's a message to you. It's a message this morning to you. If it is, you can get all this settled today, right now. And you can leave here having all that fixed. It's just so simple. It's just to trust the Lord as your Savior. Let's have a verse of a song. There'd be something.